I've critiqued a lot of mixes over the years. I looked it up. I've kept them all in a Dropbox folder. Just the the private one-on-one critiques I've done for people in this folder, it adds up to, I think it's like, yeah, 449 that I have kept track of, plus a whole bunch of live streams where we do three, four, five, six critiques per live stream. So I've done this a whole lot, and I use the project page to do these critiques. That Typically, that's where it happens. So the file comes in here, and I have a sequence of meters that I use to help me when I'm listening. Uh, and also, it's really helpful for kind of showing people where there are problems in the mix or where there are areas to look at and pay attention to. If you're a Studio One Plus member, you know Gregor and I do mix critiques every second Wednesday of the month as a live stream where we listen to members' music and offer fatigue, fatigue, (laughs) critique and feedback on those. So here is a typical, this is the most recent uh, mixed critique live stream that I did for my customers. And this, I want to show you the settings that I like to use metering wise. So level and spectrum meters to assist me in listening. And so why am I telling you this? Why should you care? Especially if you don't do any mastering, perhaps. Why should you care? I think it would be a it would be well worth your time to spend a chunk of your studio time simply listening. Find some great music, get an audio copy of it, and bring it into your project page. And as you listen and do all the normal listening listening things that you do, also pay attention to what's happening visually on the screen. Use the loudness measurements to see what the loudness measurement is of that particular song. See where the meters go. See where things jump up and come down. I'm not saying that we should mix with our eyes, of course. But these tools can be useful to kind of see, start to kind of normalize what what a good sounding mix kind of sounds and looks like on the screen. And then when we come across a mix, let's say our own mix that maybe has way too much low end, we learn to both hear it and see it and having, it's kind of like going at it with like two hands into a boxing match versus just one. We have two ways of hopefully catching those mistakes before they make it out the door and get released. Uh, I've said this a lot, but like your biggest, the, the whole thing, everything we do in the studio is listening. Uh, Yes, we're placing our hands and moving microphones and making decisions, but ultimately everything starts with these little fleshy things on the side of our head. And so if you don't make a regular habit of developing better listening skills and learning to hear and find and spot problems uh, easily and quickly, uh, the the more you do that, the better off you're going to be, is what I'm saying. So here are the settings that I like to use. So first of all, if I think these are the default settings here in the project page. I'm just going to let that play so we can have some meters here to look at. Um, But if you, this is kind of, I think, the default setup. But you actually have a lot of customization options here in the project page. The first big thing is down here. This level meter right now is showing us peak slash RMS. And that's helpful, but not super helpful for what I'm trying to do. When I'm listening to something on a mastered level, so typically that's what everything I'm critiquing is. It's been mastered on some level. And when I do mastering, I like to set this one to K14. So K14 gives me kind of a a rough target of trying to make sure that things are at least coming up over this zero mark where green goes to yellow, and then the loudest sections of the song are getting up into the red. That's the general idea of the K system in general, but K14 specifically is what I use uh, in mastering. Uh, I set this to luffs. Honestly, don't look at this all that much. It's somewhat useful, but I'd rather see what the target or what the loudness is up here when you measure the loudness of a specific audio file. It measures the whole thing and gives you a readout, which can be really handy. So you can see each song, a lot of helpful information there, specifically the luffs value and then also kind of true peak, what's happening there. You can see if anything was clipping, things like that. Okay. But the big one is this big honking meter here. It takes up most of the screen and understandably so, because this has given us a lot of information of what's happening frequency wise on the mix. And the, there's a lot of different options here. Third octave is pretty helpful. Twelfth octave is interesting because you'll notice a keyboard pops up down here. And so it divides the frequency spectrum up into notes on a piano. So if you're having an issue with the bass and it's playing a low B, you can also come in here and see, okay, low B is going to be around 60 hertz or so. And that can be helpful. I don't use that a lot, but it's, it's nifty, especially if you're kind of more your mind is kind of connects more with notes than it does frequencies. That might be a helpful kind of in between for you. Um, FFT is my favorite curve looks cool. I think FFT is a little more helpful. Um, and then these look neat and I don't use them. Segments is interesting. I may try segments at some point, but for me, FFT is the way to go. 
It stands for something. F- there's a French word in there. It doesn't really matter. Uh, if we hover over it, does it tell us what it stands for? No, it says <laughs> spectrum mode because even Studio One can't pronounce it. Um, so this is the start of this. This looks like home to me. This is familiar. I do a couple of extra things to make this a little more useful. First, I turn on the slope. Oh, hang on. Sorry. Forget forget. I said that. First, I click this smooth button right here. You see where it says smooth? Because you're so smooth. Um, and that didn't do anything because... Oh, right. Hold on. Hold on. First thing I do... I'm sorry. I, I've had this set up so often I forget how to get to it. Uh, first thing I do is set up the hold function. And if I set that to typically something like medium, so right here, this hold thing I set to medium. What that does is each little spike, wherever it gets to its highest point, it, it holds that. And if you set it to infinity on the hold, it'll stay there forever. I've got it set to medium, so it slowly comes down. So if a, if a peak happens, for example, right there, it stays peaked and I can see it after the fact. So if I miss it, I look away and look back, I'll see that something happened and it eventually slowly fades back down. That's super helpful. However, all those little pebbles on the screen, not as helpful as having it be like a line that shows me like a frequency, an EQ curve. That's where the smooth button comes in. You press smooth and it kind of combines all of those into one arguably smooth line which is super cool. And we can change if we set it to a really short decay time on the hold time, I guess. You can see it moves a lot more quickly. Set it to long, and it's a lot more slow to move because it's giving me more of a similar to an average, although there is an average setting as well. I don't use this average setting. It gives you, to me, almost a very similar curve, but I don't quite, I don't need the two. I prefer the one. It's showing me, I guess, more peak, but that's, that's fine with me. I don't like the two curves there, so I turn the average off. The other button here that I haven't messed with is the slope button. Enable slope compensation plus 3 dB per octave for pink noise. So typically, if you turn on slope, then straight across, horizontal, as you can see, that thick horizontal line, that's basically flat. However, originally this was set like this, where it used this kind of slow curve down to the right. And that is, quote unquote, flat. That's just what I've gotten used to, and so that's what I use. You can turn on the slope thing if you want and make it flat. I'm just used to, if the frequencies are hitting this curve-ish, I know that feels pretty flat to my ears, and so that's just what I'm used to. You can pick whichever one you like. But this, to me, is incredibly useful uh, because I can quickly look and see what's going on overall on the mix. I can see that there are, you know, what's happening in the top end. I like that this is curving off here, but you can also see little spikes that come through in the upper mids, which always happen. Just stuff that it gives you, like I said, a visual representation of what you're already hearing to give you kind of two forms of attack to figure out if there's a problem here. Obviously, I've already given you the caveat, don't do everything with your eyes, but I think this can be a really useful tool. And so what I'll do is I'll listen, and if there's a problem, and I see, I hear like, oh man, there's an upper mid thing, and I look over here and see a spike like that, I'll hover the mouse over that, and what's cool is it tells me what I'm hovering over. Let me move over here so you can see it a little bit better. It tells me that right here is at 104.7 hertz. That's helpful. Also tells me what note that is. It tells me... Uh, what level I'm at with the mouse, and then that, I guess that scent thing is like the tuning of the note. That's really helpful. So I can quickly say, hey, we got a problem, like a boost over here at 173 hertz. You might want to check that out in your mix and see if that needs to come down or dynamic EQ or something like that. So if you have not ever done this, I will tell you, one of the dirty little secrets of doing what I do and, and helping people via doing critiques and things like that is it helps me train my own ears as I'm giving feedback to other people. I know that seems backwards, but I've gotten to where I love listening with this thing in front of me because I'm it's become more and more familiar over the years and I highly encourage you to make it a part of your listening process. When you export a bunch of mixes and you go listen in your car and you listen on your earbuds and you do all those normal things, come back to your studio, bring those mixes into a mastering session and go through the listening process like this checking what's happening on the meters, where are the volume meters going. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but the phase meter can be really helpful. If this correlation thing goes negative, that's a red flag that something's weird and potentially phasey in your mix. You might want to pull that out. Also, this the little cool little diagram here, if it's a really vertical, it means the mix is pretty narrow. But if it goes out pretty wide and makes more of like a circle, then you can see that it's becoming your mix has a nice stereo width to it. If it's completely vertical line, that means it's mono. And then the wider it goes, the more width it has. So all of that, again, you can hear all of that. 
I don't need this visual stuff to hear the problems, but this stuff gives some really good extra feedback that I find really useful. So go try this. Again, if you don't, not again, I haven't said this yet, the project page is available on Studio One Professional, which is the top tier of Studio One, or if you're a Studio One Plus member, you get you get all of this included. So you get the song page as well as the project page, everything that's included with Professional, plus a bunch of extra goodies. If you have not checked that out yet, I highly encourage you to check it out. Thanks for watching. See you.